My name is Chris McCarthy. I'm the CEO of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. And I want to welcome everyone tonight to our Freddie Schiff 11 lecture series, which has now been online for this um, 2021 season. We're really glad that we can still bring these lectures to you. Um, unfortunately, we wish you could be in the spaces, but this is going to make you want to come to Pam as soon as you see and hear what Francis and Mike have to say. So our Freddie Schiff Levin lecture series is now in its 18th year, and it's graciously sponsored by the Levin family. We honor Freddie Schiff Levin's legacy as a member of the Provincetown Arts community by inviting artists, curators, authors, and scholars to speak at Pam. To the Levin family and to Amy Davies and Provincetown Television, we thank you for filming the series and we extend our deepest gratitude for helping us do this techie part because otherwise I think I'd be talking to myself right now. Um, thanks for joining us online. Uh, and I know it's again, not the same as being in person, but again, I, I promise you this will definitely be worth it. Tonight, we're gonna welcome artist Francis Olszewski and Schoolhouse Gallery Director, Mike Carroll. Francis has been a practicing artist for over 25 years. His newest exhibition titled The Silent Side of a Shiver, photographs by Francis Olszewski will be on display at PAM until September 19th of this year. Uh, tonight, Francis and Mike will discuss Francis's long career, his practice of making photographs and what it means to show his work at PAM. They'll also take a deep dive into the mechanics of creating one of Francis's multi-layered photographs, which are just absolutely spectacular. Um, we will be taking questions after uh, Mike and Francis's lecture. So please type your questions in the chat box. Um, if you don't mind, actually tell us where you're joining us from today as well. And um, we'll be able to answer your questions at the end of the lecture. So right now it is my honor to welcome Francis and Mike. So you guys can take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Chris. I think I'm just gonna take a, a minute and uh, before Francis begins and um, just, say, just say a few words about what it's like to look at Francis's pictures um, because I'm fortunate enough to have that, um, I'm ha to have the experience of watching people look at those photographs. And then um, tonight's lecture is going to consist of um, three segments of presentation. And um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, I just wanna um, sort of offer to people, as Chris said, what a wonderful experience it is to be, to see this particular exhibition and to view this work. Uh, I always think about um, public facing exhibitions and, and what it's like to have a room in the social architecture of many museums and many rooms filled with art and what it means and what people see when they get there. What I've observed um, in seeing people look at Francis's pictures is something quite different than what happens when people look at photography quite a bit of the time. Uh, photography being, you know, such a democratic um, art form, uh, an art form that offers all of its equipment and ideas to people the minute they're produced. Um, uh, is you know uh, results in the gallery in um, a lot of people feeling immediately involved in the photographs and able to be asked questions and often they're quite skeptical. Um, they kind of have a doubting Thomas approach to a lot of photographs. The thing that happens with Francis's work is that this is completely absent. When, when the photographs are on the wall of the gallery, people are immediately involved. They're immediately immersed there's a sort of a, um, an absence of any skepticism or doubt and an immediate involvement. And it's, it's really just a wonderful experience to watch. And so I would really urge you to come and, and take a look at this exhibition at, um, at the museum if you get a chance. Um, so um, I know that Francis, you have um, a couple of segments of presentation to start with and one is gonna be um, pictures of the museum itself, the exhibition at the museum itself. So um, perhaps we can start there. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to share my screen with everybody. So everybody can see what I'm going to be talking about. And um, so I wanted to start out um, with uh, the exhibition itself. Um, because I wanted people to see uh, the space that 
Pam so generously gave me. And it was really important to me that um, I start with that. And because I wanted not only to talk about myself, but uh, I wanted to thank Pam and, and uh, Michael and everybody else and Amy uh, and everybody else who helped me with this exhibition. Um, there was a large number of people uh, involved. Um, it got bigger than I thought it would, would be. And um, so um, without going down a list, uh, I wanted to thank everybody who had helped me. Uh, who might be listening tonight. And um, so uh, I wanted to start with just by showing um, the, the space itself. And um, just in case a lot of people who are watching this stream uh, wouldn't have an opportunity to actually see the show. Um, I do know that there are a lot of people, uh, there are a number of people who uh, wanted to come tonight and will not be able to see the show because they're just far away. And so I wanted to give that opportunity right up front. So this is the front room and, and all the pictures in the show, um, there's a main section of the show and then there's a what I refer to as a discernment area, which explains sort of where I'm coming from. So the main pictures in the show, just for people who won't get to see it, they're all four feet by six feet prints. And um, so I, I'm just gonna step through this quickly, mm -hmm. um, but, I'm, but there's, a reason, there's a point to stepping through this um, because there's an area in the show uh, that I just referred to as uh, the discernment area. And uh, also, this is uh, the catalog. The catalog is, is available at the museum. But in the show, there is this area here that I wanted to point out. Um, because that's where I'm going to start my discussion tonight. And um, I have been talking about this area uh, that I was going to put in the show for a year questioning whether I should do it, whether I shouldn't do it. And um, should it take up space? I could put some more big pictures there. But in the end, uh, with the help of my curator, mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to thank as well, uh, Brian Dunnigan um, and Michael, I wanted to make sure that um, I did include that because I wanted to explain to people where I was coming from. Um, and on that point, that's where I'm going to sort of begin. And, and I start out by telling people, um, I have been making photographs since I was a teenager, but in the real world, I, I wear two hats. And um, after graduate school, I uh, started uh, imaging technology uh, companies, and uh, we build uh, imaging technology and online publishing systems, streaming and research portals and things like that for very large institutions. But like many artists, um, you know, this, especially in the beginning of your career, um, you really have to sort of not only make as much art as you possibly can, but also make, um, try to make a living at the same time. So I was really interested in that. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up right away is because I always kept these two things very separate in my life. And, um, but I started realizing at a certain point when I started to begin this particular um, series of work is that it really, uh, it was really a cross reference for me and it really overlapped that it really was about a lot of things that I was doing on a daily basis in terms of building digital technology, but it also had a lot to do with the pictures I was making. And in the beginning of my work as an artist, I was trained as a very traditional photographer. 
um, I did my undergraduate degree in Massachusetts College of Art, uh, and I studied very, very straight photography, and, and that was the emphasis of the program. It was large view cameras, all black and white, chemistry-driven photography. And what really struck me as I learned about traditional photography and I was being trained as a young student was that I really was intrigued by what was going on in the dark room. It really, really challenged me and really I found a lot of joy in experimenting and understanding how the process worked. And one of my teachers um, in undergraduate school or for a short time, actually, um, I was lucky to meet. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say he was, he, he, I, I didn't necessarily have a, a chance to study with him because uh, he was Miter White and Miter White was at MIT uh, while I was an undergraduate. And, but our paths crossed and I got to spend some time with him. And he really had a, he had a big influence on me because he really sort of, took the idea that photography was much more than just um, taking pictures. It was really a life experience. And also it was the idea, what Miner used to do is he used to make you set up your view camera and you would go and you'd, you'd lie down in front of the lens and you try to feel it. But <laughs> that sounds funny, but uh, it was really Miner's way. Um, he was very philosophical in his life. He was very philosophical about photography. And um, during that time period, everybody sort of turned to him. Um, you know, even Sarkowski at the Museum of Modern Art, everybody was turning to Minor as this, the great teacher of photography. And he, he made people think about it in a different way. And it was really important to me to sort of have that experience with him and it was intense. And uh, I also crossed paths with Emmett Gowan and Emmett Gowan um, is probably one of the most important contemporary photographers. Um, and, but Emmett sort of brought something more to me in terms of my photography. And that was that he talked about it and that photography had to be a personal thing that you really needed to connect with the people in the, the pictures. And like Minor, you had to connect with where you were and you had to understand it and be able to, to feel it. And they used to talk about that a lot. And um, so it was really, what Emmett did for me was that he really sort of pushed the idea that make personal pictures. And he was highly influenced by Harry Callahan and Stieglitz and how they photographed their families and their loved ones. And it really had a huge influence on me because I wanted to be able to engage with myself um, when I was making pictures. So I was lucky to, to run into those two men. And also um, Emmett, was really interested in the chemistry of photography. And because I was interested in being a modern artist, I was interested in that idea as well, that it wasn't just about um, the making of the pictures, that there was a technology there. And I wanted to integrate that into uh, my work, just like the abstract expressionists talked about it as it is about painting. And, uh, and the modernists talked about it as it's about light. And uh, so I was really interested in that idea. And Emmett, you know, really sort of expanded the idea of how you would develop film and how you would develop prints. And it was really a great experience for me. And I love that. So I spent a lot of time working in the dark room and my earlier work, I was doing photograms and I was sort of expanding the idea of a single image but it wasn't multiple images. So from there, I um, ended up in the, um, the graduate program at MIT and um, that was at the Media Lab. And I was quite lucky to be there at the time. And 
there they it was the beginning of digital photography and I was really interested in that and even though I was interested in in um, the idea of manipulating photography in, in the darkroom, um, when I came across the digital image, I was really not intrigued necessarily with a heavy manipulation of multiple images and things like that. But I wanted to also expand my, my work um, as a single image. And um, it was interesting at the time because I, it sort of um, it ran contrary to what people were expecting from digital photography at the time. And that was that um, they wanted to see pixels and I would do everything I could to hide that pixel because I wanted it to look like a photograph. And, um, and people questioned my work. I said, why don't you make you know, multiple pictures and manipulate it sort of like what Photoshop does today. And it really wasn't inter uh, a big interest of mine. And what happened was it sort of pushed me out into learning more about the history of photography. And I ended up taking history of photography, not only at Massachusetts College of Art, but at MIT and BU. I took a night class at Harvard. I took a couple of other classes. And I took about as many history, photo history classes as I possibly could, because I wanted to understand the beginnings of the process and the beginnings of of the image making. And that's where it sort of starts for me. And this body of work, and I know I just sort of sat here with this screen on the, uh, but I really wanted to sort of get that out and get to the discernment area. And the discernment area is a challenging area in the exhibition because they're dark images and they also challenge the, what you look at. And that goes to the heart of my exhibition. And one particular picture that I was really interested in uh, working with was um, the, the, the first image that was ever made. And that image was made by Louis Jacques Daguerre. So there's three people who are uh, credited with the beginnings of photography. And Daguerre is um, French and uh, he partners with uh, Joseph Neps and Neps is down in south, Southern France. Daguerre, which has really always been fascinating to me and I love this idea, I just, am always talking about this, is that Daguerre was a painter. And I always say he was just an artist. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's not a pejorative statement. It is, it is meant to have people understand that one person changed the entire world to this day about how we view the world and how we come to understand the world too. Um, I love, I have pictures in my home of the Mars Romer, rover on my refrigerator. And every time I look at it, I'm thinking about that care. I mean, he was a painter that completely changed the world. And I love that idea. And I've always been interested in the idea about how artists have influenced the world and have, have made it change. And rarely do we hear about these individuals um, who have completely um, had this huge influence. So the image that I'm showing you right now is an image that I made. And it's an image of Daguerre's first daguerreotype. And it was taken in uh, 2010. And the Gare's image is here. That's what it really looks like. I'm, I'm going to point out this little sort of basket here. And the thing about it is that the Gare's image that I made in 2010, the image is gone. 
And when I took this picture, I went to Paris and I was really interested in Daguerre. And um, I went to um, the Bibliothèque and I asked to see uh, Daguerre's first picture and they had it, they had the plate. And the person who was showing me or was talking to me about this and I had to make arrangements, get somebody to get me in there and all that. And um, so they said, well, you don't want to see the plate. <laughs> you, know, you don't really want to see the plate because there's nothing there. And I said, well, no, no, I really do. So they handed me that picture. You know, they, they handed me this that was taken in 1920. And they said, no, no, here you go. You go, you take this and go away. And I said, no, I, I really want Daguerre's first. I want to see the plate. And the plate for me is that it's got all this color on the edges and it's in the discernment area of the exhibition. And it has all this color on the edges, but it also has all of these scratches. And not only that, the, the image is almost there. That little basket is right in here. I don't know whether you can see it streaming or not, but you can see it in the exhibition. And uh, you can barely see the image. But what you end up seeing here, all those scratches, and actually there's a fingerprint on it, on the plate as well. It's Daguerre's. It's Daguerre's hand that we're looking at. And it really struck me, not for the first time, but it really struck me that I was looking at something that was marked by the artist. And in photography, that doesn't happen very often. And I was really interested in that idea that we could really see through this plate, you can reach all the way back to you know, 1837, 1839, and actually see his hand on the plate. And that's what really, really intrigued me about making this picture. And that's why I like it so much too. It's a very minimalist picture, but it really stood out for me for not only all the reasons I've just described, but also that it was now a picture of nothing, but it really isn't. It has all of this history and it has everything uh, about the beginnings of photography in it. And one of the other parts that's really important to me that struck me was to make a daguerreotype, you had to have a very highly polished surface. And it was a silver coated copper plate. And when you look at a daguerreotype in, in regular today, lighting or sunlight, you really can't see it. You have to sort of tilt it or you have to be able to put it in a particular light setting to be actually to be able to see it. And, you know, daguerreotypes, I've heard people say uh, that they weren't made for to be seen in daylight. They were made to be seen in candlelight. And I really love that idea. And also the daguerreotypes would always come in those little boxes and they were very, really small and they were opening, they opened like a book. And people talk about these things. And I love the idea that it was meant to be something that was closed and it was meant to be put in a breast pocket and it was meant to be held close to the heart. And I just love that, that concept. It, it just touched me. But it was also the reflected surface that really, really struck me. And that's really what started me thinking about the types of pictures that are in the exhibition, the main pictures in the exhibition. So in the discernment area as well, there's, um, I'm gonna sort of jump around a little, if you don't mind. Um, there's also this image. I made, I mentioned the three inventors of photography and I mentioned Joseph Netz uh, and Louis Jacques Daguerre and Williams, William Fox Talbot, who is English. And he made the negative positive system. So what I ended up doing was I ended up making the pilgrimage to where they 
made their first images. And what I'm showing you here is Nepsis image today. But these pictures were made at dusk, so they're dark. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but um, this is, so I went to the exact, I, I made the pilgrimage, pilgrim, pilgrim, pilgrimage to the house, Nepsis house, and I stood in the exact same spot and I made the exact same image, but I made it with you know, high resolution digital camera. And I was just thrilled to be there and to be able to see what he saw, although it's, quite, it's probably quite different today. But it really was a really moving moment for me as a photographer. And Nepsa only made one picture. He only succeeded once. He couldn't repeat it. And he utilized um, uh, a chemistry called betamin of Judea, and that is a tar-based material. And when I was a student, everybody talked about Nepsis picture, and there's only one, it's in, at the Ramson uh, Library at the University of Austin in Texas. And, it, and you can barely see it because it's, I don't think it's necessarily been, it's faded away a little, but it's that polished surface as well. It didn't have the resolution that a daguerreotype had. It was sort of fuzzy. But when I was a student, my professors taught me that, oh, it took a couple of hours. But much more learned people over time have discovered that, oh, then it became, oh, it wasn't just a couple of hours, it was a full day. And then the next research group said, oh, no, it wasn't just one day, it was three days. And now they're talking about, I've heard people say, oh, no, he had the lens open for a week. So, <laughs> so, so it's always changing. And I love that idea. So this is Neps. And this is Talbot. So I went and I tried to sort of re reproduce some of their images and Talbot did a picture. He, Talbot was, was in, in Great Britain, or he was in England, and he was creating a process that was based upon paper. And he gave us the negative positive system that we ended up using uh, through the chemi chemistry, uh, chemical aspects of photography. And I'm sure most people recognize that. But this is a view that he made as well. And it was of his window in his hallway. And um, so I went to that same spot. And again, it was meant to be done at dusk. And then this is Daguerre's image. This is a view from Daguerre's chateau. Unfortunately, there is no, other than what I've shown you as the first um, daguerreotype, Daguerre only made probably about 14 daguerreotypes, I mean, uh, that, that we're aware of. And they're probably much more smarter people than I who probably would say, well, no, he did 10 or he did 17. And I've heard those numbers tossed around. But Daguerre really wanted to be seen not only as an inventor, but he, he wanted to see himself people to see it as an art form. But this picture is taken from his chateau. And when he became, when he invented photography, he gave it to the people of France for free. And the king said, you, if you give it to the people of, of France for free, I will give you a chateau, a, a stipend for the rest of your life. And he became a rock star in, in uh, France. And, and so I was very interested in what was going on with Daguerre clearly. And I went, and got into his chateau, it was very difficult to get into. Um, and I don't want to get into that, but um, the uh, but I got to the top of it and I got to shoot uh, a beautiful picture from his top window. And I really liked that idea a lot. I was thrilled. So those three pictures, and again, it was done at dusk. And for me, it was more of a conceptual idea about me making pictures at dusk that I was very much aware that that type of photography, the chemical based photography had come to an end. And that's why I chose to do it at dusk. That was sort of my, 
idea about all doing it that way. So in the discernment area, there's this picture as well. And this one is a little odd. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a great photograph. Uh, probably not a great thing to say when I'm having an exhibition. <laughs> but what I like about this picture is that it's an optical image in that if you understand the use of lenses and you understand the way we see, um, and that's what I'm interested in, I'm really interested in the way we see, um, that it's very hard to see that this is a full-blown portrait of Charles Darwin. He's wearing a hat, it's a headshot, and it fills most of the frame. And a lot of people, when they see this print, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, I don't know what, I, what you see, but when I look at this picture, all I see is Darwin. But a lot of other people, and, and myself included when I first saw it, only saw the architecture. But it's an optical trick. And trick tends to be a negative, and I don't like that, using it that way. I don't like the idea of I'm trying to trick people, I'm not. What it is though, is it's an example of how photography works and how we see it and how people come to it with their own ideas and their own perceptions. So when I talk about the main pictures in my exhibition, uh, I, I, I'll talk about that idea, about the idea of when you look out into the world, are you confused? Is, is it something that is, you're seeing something right in front of you, but you might not see what's behind it and things like that. And though that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how we see. Uh, this is an early picture that uh, I'm gonna skip over, but I did wanna mention um, another big influence on me. Um, I was quite lucky because of the two hats that I wear. Um, to uh, work at Oxford University um, for a while. Um, but I was really sort of looking for, not certainly not mentors, but I was looking for someone who sort of represented uh, a, a person who did more than just one thing, that you could be an artist and you could make technology, you could build technology. And, um, and someone like that, and who I certainly was aware of this person's work for even as a student, but as I, when I was at Oxford, I became more ingrained, uh, more ingrained in, with his work because a lot of it was there and because he was there. And that was uh, Charles Ludwig Dotson uh, and um, known as uh, Lewis Carroll. And Carroll was a, a great photographer. And this image here is a picture of his photographic kit that I searched out at Oxford and I asked if I could photograph it. And there was a piece of glass in front of it. And uh, I ended up being in the picture. That's uh, my reflection in, in here. But Carol for me really was uh, a huge influence. Not only was he a photographer, but he was, everybody knows him as a writer. And um, you know the great, the great Lewis Carroll, but he also was uh, a mathematician and also a clergyman as well. And so I was really intrigued by him. And Carroll is a is a really interesting character. He's seen through different lenses in different ways over time, and I like that idea. And he really was one of the most important Victorian photographers of the time. He photographed all the important um, people in the Victorian age in Great Britain. And he, 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 a lot of people don't know that about him, um, but he was a really interesting photographer. And we hear about Margaret Cameron, who was a fantastic photographer who did the same thing. 
uh, who photographed beautiful portraits of the Victorian age, but Carroll did it as well. And, um, but he is more known for Alice. And um, what intrigued me about Carol's writing was that I thought there was a prominence of, of not belonging and uh, in his writing. And I was intrigued by that and I related to it. And so this picture here is a picture I made. It was one of the earliest pictures that I made, let's call it, in the current body of work that's being shown at um, Pam. Um, and this is, this is Alice. And so it's a picture of a picture. Uh, and also I, I'm a postmodernist. I, 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 I'm very happy to say that. And I, I've always made, I like the idea of making pictures of pictures. And so for me, it was really a shocking experience when I got there and basically Carol had Alice come outside, put her, she was standing against a big dark background it was made out of stone and it was almost black and she's sort of standing in front of it and um, she's wearing this white dress and it's a beautiful little portrait of Alice as a young woman and for me, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing it. And then all of a sudden for me, I'm seeing what is behind me that's being reflected on the glass. And it, I started thinking about what I mentioned to you earlier about the daguerreotypes and the reflected image and the reflected surface. And all of these things started to come together for me very quickly. And I really, really was intrigued by the entire process. It really, really hit me hard. And um, I really like that idea a lot. So it really goes to um, all of that in terms of being able to talk about the exhibition at PAM. And these are the pictures that are in the exhibition. And I showed you the installation shots, but one of the I want to start with is I want to dissect this a little for you. So this is one of my most recent pictures and I really like it a lot. And uh, it's something, um, that really stood out for me. One of the things that I do when I make pictures is that some people have said, Oh, Francis, I'm, I get it. It's the decisive moment. And I said, no, it's not the decisive moment. Oh, it's abstraction. No, nope, it's not abstraction. Uh, for me, my pictures are about realism. And I refer to it as hyper-realism. And that's because of my two hats. And uh, because I believe this has to do with technology. It has to do with how we live today. And this particular picture really, really struck me. And that... When I make these pictures, I don't go hunting like the decisive moment. Um, I, I will wander through the cities and I may see a place that I want to photograph and I will possibly do a sketch, possibly take something with my cell phone. And uh, I'll make notes about where I am and the time of day and the type of light time of year and things like that. And then I will go back and I will go back again and I will go back again. And in this particular case, this took many different visits to this particular spot. And when I would go there, I would often spend a great deal of time there. And, um, and I would often, if you when I show you my other work, you'll, you'll, you might get a sense of this. I was often quite, I was hassled that somebody would come out and say, what are you doing? You have, you've been standing in front of my window for the last two days and I, I don't like it. I'm going to call the cops and things like that. So it was always uh, an intriguing experience for me. And I, I really liked it. 
And this particular picture was in a building that had a doorman and he would come out and he would say, what are you doing, man? You got, you can't be standing here, go away. And you got a camera, it's not cool. And I would say, you know, let me stay. And I'd give him some money and he would be happy for about a half an hour and I'd get to stay. And, and things would be happening around me. And in this case, I'm looking at this picture and I'm looking at the, the reflection and behind me, because I'm in London, it's a very short street, it's very tight. And the, the buses are right at my back and I can almost feel them. And I'm very close to the windows. And, um, and I can see this, this, this picture, I can see it, but it keeps going by me. It keeps going by. And I, I, I had to figure out how can I get this picture to stop? Um, how can I get this whole thing in, into the picture? So what I mean by that is that, you know, the, the birds, the young woman, the butterflies, the decor, that's all in front of me. And it's very close to me. Uh, I'm very, very close to that that young woman, and it's it's dusk, and this goes to the pictures that I was talking about earlier as well. Is that I realized that I could get light from the inside at dusk, and a lot of times people didn't necessarily see me because the lights were on in the inside but I could see them. And then I realized that if I went at a particular time of day, the buses would queue up. And then finally, I was there at a particular time of day where they were right smack behind me. And that's how I made this picture. So the bus is behind me and the people in the bus are being lit by the interior um, lights of the bus itself. So for me, it's, it's all about that idea that I'm taking pictures, I'm taking pictures that are in front of me and also behind me. And it really is really, really important to me that the idea what I'm trying to do is that, as I said earlier, I want people to be somewhat confused. Um, as I said, I am quite confused when I walk around the world about what I'm looking at. And maybe it's just me, but um, it really is really exciting. Every time I go out into the world, every time I open my eyes after I've been asleep, that I walk out into the world and I'm somewhat confused about what I'm seeing. And I really like that idea. And uh, it makes me feel good. And uh, so that's what a lot of these pictures are about. And, but it's also about the idea of technology today and that technology now is surrounding us. And I'm a huge fan of it. And I believe it makes us, and I can get in trouble for saying things like this, but it's almost godlike that we can use technology to uh, see completely around the world. And also, like I was saying earlier about my pictures on my refrigerator, I can see the Mars and um, thanks to Daguerre. And, but this, concept of technology surrounding us, you know, knows when we're asleep, it knows when we're awake, so it, it knows when we've been good, it knows when we've been bad. It has all of those uh, aspects to it. And I really like that idea. So my pictures are related to that in, in a way that it's not only about what's in front of you, it's what's through and it's what's behind. And I love that idea. And so that's what a lot of these pictures are about for me. And that's the thing that's in the exhibition, I hope. And that's the thing that I make pictures about. This particular picture was made in Paris. This is a, this is a nighttime picture, which is rare for me actually. Uh, but it was quite, there was a lot of light 
involved. Um, and what was really interesting about this picture is that I was really close and I'm often quite close to people when I'm photographing them, but because there may be, there may be a piece of glass between us, they don't necessarily see me. Or if they do see me, there's that glass. So there's the separation. And the young woman on the left is in front of me. The woman on the right is behind me. And the way the picture ends up being flattened, it really sort of resonates in a way that just was so exciting to see. And, um, you know, that orange thing on the right side, and you know, these these religious figures in the window. It was really, really an exciting image for me. And this is an image called, um, so now I'm gonna step through the, through the uh, pictures and that it's called Angel. And it was, again, one of those days where I had to keep going back. I went back, I went back the next day, the day after I kept going, I kept trying to find the light. And I guess that's, that's exactly what I was doing. I was looking for the light to be correct and where I could get something um, that was really sort of even across the plane. And this particular picture has a beautiful palette to it. And I could see that too when I was making the picture. And the reason I call it angel is because of this figure in here is a little angel. And then there's this guy over there it's a painting on the wall, and this woman on the right side. And again, I'm in, I'm in London in this particular picture, and the sidewalk, the streets are small, and the sidewalks are small, and like people are bumping into me to get by. And it really is really an interesting experience for me, and I, I love it. And um, this picture is uh, from Florence, and um, it's referred to as Box Hat Man. And uh, it's near the Duomo. And um, so a lot of people have said to me, I don't know why, why, why are you calling this box hat man? And that I'm very, very close to the glass. And um, there is an individual in the middle of the frame and he's here and he's wearing a box on his hat on his head and on his back, and this is his portrait, and on his back, he's got an accordion. And in photography, in photog it, it, when you learn photography, the best way to photograph is with both eyes, not with one. You know, you always see the photographer sort of squinting, looking through the lens, but the best way to do it is with both, eyes, both of your eyes open. So you can see through the lens and you all also can see what's around you. And I could see this guy coming toward me. And I'd been at this spot, I'd been there a year earlier and I made a picture and it wasn't successful at all. And I went back and I had been here for a number of days and this guy was coming down the street and it just sort of clicked. I mean, it was just absolutely a fantastic moment for me. And uh, this is a picture that was made in London. And this is another example, uh, or this is a, a really good example of how I make pictures and, and because I'm, because of the, the light on the inside and different light on the outside. And I am as close to these men on the left as I am to this computer now. I mean, I'm literally probably two or two feet from these guys and they didn't see me at all. And I was there for a long time uh, trying to make this picture. And um, this is a beautiful picture of my wife, Anna Poor, the great sculptor, and um, this was done in Paris. Uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. This was, um, this is a picture that was done in, um, in Rome. And um, again, it's this idea about the, it's, it's the idea about making pictures of pictures. So there are pictures in front of me in frames and then there is the glass and then there's pictures behind me. 
So all of these things come together. And so it is pictures of pictures of pictures for me. And that's why I like it so much. And I've already told you about this one. And this is a really a favorite picture of mine as well. And this is um, a picture I made in my home. And I started to experiment. Um, and I'm giving away some of the, some people have said, don't, don't explain the whole thing. Uh, but I don't mind explaining it that much. But um, I'm really interested in the reflected surface. And because I go back to the daguerreotype and to NEPS, um, in terms of this particular picture, is that this was done on a very high gloss paint. And the reflection is in the paint. So it really made me think about Neps's betterment of, of Judea <laughs> and the tar. And, and I really like the idea about being able to make pictures not, not all, a lot of people said, oh, these are all exteriors. And they're not. Some of them are interior pictures as well. And this is a really interesting picture for me because this was made at MIT and I was working there and, and I would be walking by this space every day. And it was like, oh man, this is really too much. And then I would go back the next day and then I started bringing, I would make sketches and I would record when I was there, what type of day it was, and also the season of the year. And uh, it was really a really interesting experience for me because there's multiple pieces of glass in front of me. And then at some point, this young, beautiful woman walks by and was like, oh my God, I, I just couldn't believe it. And then she, it's called MIT in an umbrella and the umbrella sort of shoots up out of her hand and it's like fireworks um, at the top of the image. And this is a picture that was done in, in London. And um, I was gonna start to point out, sometimes I'm in my pictures. Actually, this picture is in, in the exhibition. We took it out. But I did want to point, I wanted to use this picture in the lectures because sometimes I end up in the picture and I don't like that idea. Uh, I really work really hard to get out of it. And uh, at some point, somebody came up to me in that, at one of the exhibitions that I was having and said, Francis, I didn't know you made self-portraits. And I looked at this person. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. But I was in the pictures. And even though that I knew I was in the picture, I'd never really thought about it in that way. That I don't want to be in these pictures. But I do end up in, in, in some of them. And, uh, you know, this particular picture was a really beautiful object and it was just a crazy experience and I think I'm starting to run out of time here. Um, this is this is the only picture in the exhibition that was done up in the United States. It was um, it was done in uh, New York. Yeah and, and this is that that same sort of concept that I was talking about. Here I am. I didn't want to be in that picture, but I, I ended up in the picture. And these people just sort of came out, held up this, this doll. I didn't know what they were doing. It was great. It's absolutely fantastic. And, and this picture here, this guy on the right kept walking by me. I could see him in, behind me. He would walk behind me, then he'd walk in front of me. He was trying to figure out what I was doing. And I love that. And, and then he came and he said, well, I can do that too. And there he was. <laughs> it was great. So uh, this is um, uh, an image in London. So that's basically the exhibition. And um, I, I thought, I think I'm going to start running out of time here. So Michael, anybody there? Hi, thank you, Francis. Um, I think we're going to see if anybody has any questions, but um, I'm just going to say one thing to kind of wrap up after listening to you. Thank you so much, um, which is sort of a, a plug for the actual exhibition itself. And that is to say that you've heard Francis talk about um, the discernment wall and then sort of the inside of these pictures. And one of the things I just wanted to mention to people that will have a chance to see the exhibition is that the discernment wall is so fascinating. It's so interesting because it, you know, it tells a lot about um, Francis's interests and pursuits, but it's actually kind of a holographic demonstration of how he pursues an idea. 
you'll see in the discernment wall, for example, in the daguerre in the daguerreotype picture, an image of complete absence of images. You'll see another picture in the discernment wall that has an absence of light. So he, um, it's a it's a sort of a muscular demonstration of the energy with which Francis pursues his investigations, which to me is always so interesting because it's so complete, all the way from a total absence of light to a complete immersion of light, all the way deep into history, back into something totally contemporary. His practice itself is like that. Um, it's a real treat to work with and listen to an artist, for example, who has gotten to the point in their career where their ideas and intentions are really directly connected to the experience of the viewer. Of course, the viewer's experience is different and personal, but this is uh, an artist who can identify what they want and can stay connected to that pursuit and connected to the outcome in the pictures. And so that discernment wall is sort of a four-sided box that demonstrates how Francis's ideas are pursued and delivered. The museum itself at this point is another four-sided box that shows a larger version of those ideas pursued and delivered. And then Francis has just talked about a couple of these photographs, if you will, another four-sided holographic space where we see and can experience that total immersion, you know, being inside of one of those ideas and all of the many ways that they are haptic and sensory. And, you know, we can see his sort of mastery and agency enacted there. So thank you, Francis. I'm gonna turn it over to, I can't remember who's doing the questions, but maybe Chris, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Francis. This is really just fascinating, and and I love that the fact that this this exhibition is in the in the gallery with the big glass window, which is yeah. quite reflective as well. So I it, it kind of works that way. Um, we have a couple of comments and a question. We do have a comment that said that I love that wall. It was so informative, and I can't wait to see it again. Um, we have a question: How do you make the prints? And I think you explained your process of taking the pictures. And I think maybe this is a little bit more technical about actually how you, how you print these photographs. Yeah. Um, all these are uh, pigment um, archival prints. Um, they're printed with me and my printer uh, together. I, I spend a lot of time printing. I'm very particular about how I print uh, because of my sort of story about the dark room and the chemistry. I'm really very in, interested in, in getting a beautiful print um, in the digital process. A lot of my contemporaries sort of laugh at me and they say, what do you mean, Francis? Just hit the button, forget about it. You know, it's digital now, you don't have to do any of that stuff. But not for me, it's really a, a hard process, but I love it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. And then I, um, if you have time, would you please say something about how Mike Carroll and Brian Dunnigan contributed to this exhibition and tell us something about the catalog? Well, Brian and I are very dear friends. And um, so what I can say about Brian is that I want to. I want to thank her for believing in me and uh, and believing in the pictures, and that's what I think. Brown and we we talked about it at one point, um, and she you know she said that you know I believe in what you're doing and 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 that she was a fan of my work and and I and I great appreciated that she really understood where I was coming from and and that was really important to me too. That discernment area, my long description of all of that, uh, Rana knows it. I mean, because I had talked to her about it for a long time, so she understood the history of where I was coming from. And there are a lot of other pictures uh, that are, are about the history of technology and things like that that Brian uh, is aware of. So she really had a good understanding of uh, of my history of making pictures, and Mike. Um, marshaled this entire experience for me. And I think I mentioned earlier, I, when I started this process, I didn't have any of these prints. They all had to be made. 
for the exhibition. Um, designers were involved and it was really quite an experience. And, and Michael shepherded the entire event for me and I could not have done it without him. So um, that's what's really, really great. And, and the catalog is a beautiful, small little piece that I really liked. There's a great piece. Thank you, Chris. Uh, did a beautiful piece in there. Uh, Brad Dunnigan from the curator describes my process that she understood and why she thought it would be a great uh, exhibition at the museum. And Michael talks about um, the idea of an artist making pictures, uh, the practice of being an artist and Michael and I working together over the years. And then there's another uh, piece that was written by Alan Klotz, who's my dealer in, in New York. And so I really liked that idea of bringing all these people together in one place in the catalog. And then it concludes with thanking people, everybody I've mentioned, but also uh, my wife, Anna Poor, and my daughter, Mona Poor-Olchavsky, uh, who I couldn't have done any of this work with. And I always end all any catalog or any book I've ever made it always ends with a page a picture uh, a picture I've made of Anna and Mona. Okay, I, I have one last question for you, um, Francis. Your work spans the history of photography, linking past and present. Where will you go next, and how do you respond to the explosion of digital manipulative photography, which seems to result in a very narrow idea of beauty? You seem to urge for more realism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Manipulative photography is everybody can do it now. I mean, we can do it on our phones. I mean, we can do it very easily. And um, I built that technology. I can I can do that really well. I had very good friends of mine saying, "Francis, why are you doing all this with you know going out there and spending all this time in the middle of nowhere?" <laughs> you know, make you can make this picture digitally. You can make it all up. And, but that wasn't what I really wanted to do. And, but I, I have a great admiration for digital technology. I think it's absolutely fabulous. And I love the idea that everybody has access to it now and that everybody can do it. Um, and um, so, and you can see it in, in social media and every, everywhere else it just continues to grow. And I like that idea. I, I think it's it's a good thing. I believe in technology. I like the idea. The advancement of technology has set us free, as far as I'm concerned, and it and that's what I think is great about digital photography. Thank you so much, and thank you to our audience. Um, this was really wonderful. This has given me so much more insight to be able to speak about your work when I bring people through the museum. So thank you, Michael. Thank you for all your help as always. And please join us. Um, I don't even know the next one, but I know we have more Freddie Schiff Levins coming up. You can find out anything you need to know about what's happening at PAM on our website at pam.org. So thanks again, everyone. And I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Thanks again. Okay. Great. Thank Bye. You. Bye.